everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Strategy Operations and Finance Committee on the 4th of July. Um, and I'll... Oh, Independence Day, yes. Good stuff. Well, it works fireworks later on tonight, if that's the one. Yeah. Um, or, or this morning. <laughs> fireworks this morning. <laughs> Don't get too excited there, Councillor Wilson. <laughs> right, uh, Council Blessing, I'd like to ask uh, Council Halliday to run us through that, please. Through you, Madam Chair. As we deliberate on the issues before us, we trust that we will reflect positively on the communities we serve. Let us all seek to be effective and just, so that with courage, vision and energy, we provide positive leadership in a spirit of harmony and compassion. Thank you. And we have apologies today from uh, Kim Tahiwi and Councillor Hanford, who is on leave of absence. We also have uh, Glenn Olson and Glenn Cooper, I think, online. Um, so, uh, so I, could someone move those uh, apologies, uh, please? Uh, uh, Councillor Halliday, seconded uh, Councillor Kabano, thank you. De declarations of interest, are there any to be declared of items relating to the agenda? None. Uh, public speaking time, we have no uh, uh, public speakers this morning, no deputations, members of business. Uh, leave of absences, are there any that people would like to raise this morning? We do have a matter of an urgent nature which has been raised. Uh, I'm proposing to defer that to after the reports section today, uh, as we have some other, you know, more straightforward items to get onto before we discuss that one. So that yeah, that will become come after the report section. Uh, and updates, there are no updates. Uh, right. So moving on to reports. And we're going to start with um, 9.3, which is elected members' remuneration expenses and allowances policy. And I'd ask Steffi to take us through that, please. Yeah. Oh, Anna's yeah. going to, sorry. Morning, Nikoto. Um, it's, it's a fairly easy report. It's, it's just a 3.7% blanket pay rise. Um, but I'll take the rest of the report as read, and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. No questions? Uh, Councillor Halliday? Okay, so the, we are moving, uh, we are noting, hang on, let me just get my... Yep, page 169. Uh, yep, uh, yeah. We're noting the updated elected members' remuneration expenses and allowances. Um, so, uh, do, we have, do we have a seconder for that? Uh, Deputy Mayor Kirby. Any discussion? Oh, look, just happy to say, Madam Chair, this is uh, out of our control. This is something that's set by the Remuneration Authority. Yep. Uh, a lot of people think that we set our own wages here and pay ourselves absorbent amounts of money, which is not actually the case. Uh, I would wish. be nice, wouldn't uh, it? It would. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and again, I'll just take the uh, chance to push the barrow with regards to uh, remuneration aspects. The central government really needs to be looking at resetting this. Um, it's not fit for purpose, in my opinion. If we want to attract the right sort of people that want sitting around this table, not taking anything away from the fantastic people that we have around this table at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I do think they need to review uh, the amounts that are being paid to elected members to fulfil yes. the roles that have changed substantially over the, yeah, um, absolutely. Over the years. It's, as you know, it's a pretty intense role and we certainly don't get remunerated well on an hourly rate. Uh, heck no. <laughs> All right, I'll yep, put... So, oh, through, yeah, through yeah, you, Madam right. Chair, I'd just like to totally talk all those comments. It was a conversation that came up at the recent... Um, local government infrastructure symposium when I was talking to other elected members from across the country, particularly some of the smaller councils, it's a disincentive for younger people um, and particularly young parents yes, uh, to stand for local office and there are some people who are considering standing down because of that challenge who are very valued in their councils, so definitely talk, talk all that. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, any further discussion? No. Oh, so I'll yep, oh Councillor Wilson. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing concern for me that when you're the chair of a community board, not it's not something that I have been, but I've observed them all, I don't think for a moment that the chair of the Paikakariki Community Board or the Raumati Community Board uh, work any less diligently um, than the chairs of the other community boards. And yet the chair of the Paikakariki Community Board the remuneration is half. Mm. It's the same. It's basically it's the same job, you know. And if we if we if we in the equal pay field, which I am, uh, it just seems wrong to me. And mm. so when there is a um, when the pie gets three point seven bigger, uh, I'm a bit of a fan of redistributing it um, along more sort of Marxist lines. Um, if you get the opportunity to do that. So um, it's just something that, you know, we're probably not going to do anything about that today, but I just think that it, that's something that should be observed. And, unless somebody can make the case that the Raumati Community Board Chair and the... Lazy yeah, is a lazy... <laughs> to, qu to, to quote him, is a lazy boss. Um, but I'm pretty sure the Paikakariki Community Board Chair isn't. Um, it's, it's just if somebody can explain to me why, and I know the number rationale, but in terms of the workload, it doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, I think Steffi has an answer to that. Um, so it's said by the Remuneration Authority, and they assess that based on population. Whether that's right or wrong, I can't comment. But yeah, there's a formula. Yeah, not our decision, unfortunately. Okay, no more discussion. I'll, I, oh, okay, this is a wow, All right, yes, I, topic. I, I won't comment on uh, Nigel's rather wise words there, but um, <laughs> the one thing, and I know we're going to get the same answer, but I just thought it's probably worth noting, because the other thing there is that the Paikakariki Raumati Ward Councillor sits on two community boards, yep. mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that's reflected in that remuneration either. So I know that won't change through this, but something to note for the people that do make that decision. Mm -hmm. um, I know the current ward councillor is happy with that, but future ward councillors may kind of not yeah. be so happy. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we're kind of grappling with a one-size-fits-all remuneration policy, aren't we, which uh, is not tailored to our, our specific circumstances. So, through you, Madam Chair, yes. that, it, that actually is something we can um, have influence over because we divide the pool of councillors' uh, remuneration, mm -hmm. and that was taken into consideration when setting the remuneration mm -hmm. for this triennium. Um, it's good to be reminded, though, of that extra impost on that um, position, mm -hmm. and that should be taken into account when that process right. happens okay. um, after the next election. Right, thank you. All right, I'll uh, put that motion to the vote. All those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Okay, moving on to uh, 9.1. Madam is Chair, I'm just wondering, uh, sorry, um, I just wanted to uh, bring up the possibility. I note that we've got a um, person in the public here that's going to be presenting for 9.2. Um, I'm thinking that's going to be a fairly quick, um, uh, a fairly quick paper as well. Yes, 1.2 is, is okay. Um, I wonder if you perhaps bring that forward um, as well um, at this stage, because I'm not too sure how long the um, omnibus plan will go. Right. It'll be quick or be okay, quite long. Okay, I'll be happy to do that. So we'll move on then to 9.2. And uh, we have Sandra Daly here from Capital Health Advisory Group. Kia ora and, and welcome to um, Sandra. Um, so we do have a council operations paper that we are tabling today um, following um, uh, some very good uh, discussion at the Social Sustainability Committee. Uh, we are seeking today um, uh, subsequent from that discussion approval of the work plan for the Capital Health Advisory Group for 2425. 
and just noting um, that a budget consideration of up to 5000 is going to be funded to support that work program from within our baseline. So it's not additional funding we're seeking. Um, we will take the paper as read, um, and Sandra's here uh, alongside me if there's any questions today. Are there any questions? Councillor Warwick. Oh, there's one. Um, is that 5,000 above the support, staff support that is given with secretarial? That doesn't include the secretarial support? Correct. Yeah. So um, that is to support um, the Catholic Health Advisory Group in their work programme. Any other questions? Happy to move, Madam Chair. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Wilson? Uh, would you like a I would. right of introduction to her? Yeah, right of introduction. Um, first of all, Sandra, I just want to thank you so much for uh, your role as chair of the Catholic Health Advisory Group. Uh, it's been my privilege to uh, work with you over the last years uh, and um, your um, tenaciousness with regards to moving this forward is much appreciated uh, and um, I feel very humbled to be able to have um, empowered the Catholic Health Advisory Group. Um, we're very fortunate, as we've noted before, that in our district we have a lot of very experienced people, a lot of our that are retired, and this is a fantastic yeah. example of our community yeah. Yeah. Um, in their retirement, since the majority of people in that group are retired, um, utilising those skills for the betterment of our community. Um, I am great, it's great having you on board as well, Gina, um, and um, it's, it's um, where we've come in a very short period of time, now that your group's been legitimised with the five working strings, I think it's very, very exciting, uh, and we'll have very, very positive outcomes. And the fact that it's been done on fundamentally the smell of an oily rag, uh, but with regards to the Secretariat and obviously the space and, and resources being able to be provided, um, I think it's, um, um, it's just amazing. Uh, and I guess it's... Um, one of those things that, um, um, yeah, I had a fantastic little thought then, I was going to pop out, but it just went poof, out of my head. Um, <laughs> but um, from my perspective, it's, it's, it's um, been great to see this outcome happen, and I'm very, very much looking forward to seeing, now that we're into the uh, new long-term plan uh, time frame, if you'd like to actually be uh, coming back with some results. It's an interesting one, isn't it? I know there's a whole heap of work going on behind the scenes, but it, I think we're going to have things start cropping up um, a bit further in, in the not too distant future that will actually show some very, very good positive result. And um, of course, one of the things I have noticed that's just come back to me is that this is not something that um, is usually uh, in a council budget. This is something that really is, is provided for by central government, hence why our budget's so low in this space. We're going to be moving into an advocacy role. But if there are deliverables in that, uh, we will be advocating to central government with regards to funding in regards to that, but also um, hoping to direct uh, how our district is looked after, um, should we say, from that health perspective. Very much looking forward to seeing the results of that work. So again, thank you very much. And if you could pass on that regards, or thanks to the uh, team would be much appreciated. Thanks, Martin. Um, Councillor Spires. Thank you. I just wanted to echo what Councillor Halliday has just said, and thank you, Sandra. KHAG's now going from strength to strength under your leadership and with the support of the Social Sustainability Committee and Martin's Meet Committee. I think you're making headway now and it's, yeah, full steam ahead. So I just wanted to say thank you for all the hard work. And they're all volunteers on the KHAG, which is really good. So I just wanted mm. to, yeah, say thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor Kirby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to note under in the report under the issue uh, point 10, the comment about um, ongoing opportunity to gain better understanding of work progressing in Ōtaki. I just want to highlight the fact that, um, that KHAG's doing amazing work, but we're also conscious that Ōtaki is a little bit of a gap in their work and, uh, and how we're progressing that in terms of health. And so I just, I wanted to highlight that in this debate moment, that that is an ongoing conversation yeah. around yeah. Uh, how we're going to work with mm -hmm. Ōtaki to ensure that their health needs are being met. Um, mm -hmm. Acknowledging that it is a very different field uh, of work up mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. under old, the old DHB system, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So just to note that. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Wilson. Uh, yep, <coughs> uh, ditto for those previous comments. Um, 
The my question around is, and it is a question unusually, but um, does mm -hmm. KHAG feel constrained at all from the advocacy role by virtue of of its relationship with council? And and the reason I asked, I brought this up at the Social Sustainability Committee, so it's just for the for a wider audience. So say for instance, when the government decided that they wouldn't be funding. Um, cancer drugs that they had uh, promised all the way through the election d is, and I know members of KHAG certainly had a view about that, <clears throat> but did you feel at all constrained or do you see, see that as outside of KHAG's role? Because Martin had just talked about advocacy becoming an increasing part of it. That, that was a particularly difficult situation because on the one hand we don't want to get into at this point, while we're still building our compelling case, into too much conflict with central government. And we've had we've had um, a number of letters we've written to uh, Shane Reti and people. And at this point, we felt that was something that there was a lot of a lot of noise being made about. And if we, if you would like us to um, to push for you to advocate on such things. We are all up for it. Our people are really keen to be involved. Um, but just being aware of the sensitivity as we mm -hmm. head into yeah. our compelling case. Yeah. No, no, that's cool. And, and it's just as long as KHAG itself doesn't feel constrained by the council process. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure Martin would welcome it as well. So that's what KHAG's there for. Um, and any advice that comes through that then politically can be picked up. Um, mm. Because there are, I mean, it validates a lot of views when it comes from what's happening on the ground. You know, rather than just a high-end political view, people go, well, actually, this is what we're experiencing, this is what's happening in the real world, and then to be able to say so. But I, I totally get your point. Mm. I think the longer... <coughs> sorry, the the longer we're, we're in operation, the more we're seeing needs to be done. And, and um, from little things like, well, like um, the use of more technology that would save people trips to town that we, we saw last meeting, to things like the lack of an urgent pharmacy here, and which is, creates real problems for people. Um, we can see things where your advocacy would be a big help. So um, if you're saying go ahead, mm. then we will certainly be able to do that. Thank you, Board Member Butler. Yeah, thanks so much, Ray, Madam Chair. Um, just a quick question. Given that OHAG exists, the Otaki Health and Advisory Group, could you just explain how KHAG is working with OHAG and how that relationship exists or doesn't? Uh, I, um, we have reached out to OHAG because clearly there's a need for us to work together. Um, they do have their own area and their own role, and they're not that keen on engaging, but um, that's not from our point of view. For whatever reason, they um, they see it as outside their role. Sorry, I'm, I'm just going to follow up on that. Um, uh, today, obviously, we're hearing from the Capital Health Advisory Group on the wonderful co-puffer that is underway. Um, and um, their focus um, that they think is important from what they see um, from the research <coughs> and evidence that they've been undertaking. That is a component of work um, that is happening in our system in, in Kapiti. So I think you might have heard for, um, a little bit from, from me and my um, area of council operations about wanting to look at the system and the sector. Yep. Um, I think it's, it's right and it's possible that there's more than one group engaged um, um, in this um, because we haven't even covered off things like the Iwi Māori Partnership Board that also sits across the entire district um, and how that fits together. Um, but that is part of the work that we are progressing and we are working with all the individual components. So um, what I can say is that um, uh, Sandra and the Kapiti um, Health Advisory Group have been reaching out. Uh, Gina, who's also sitting here, is um, very much engaged with um, the Ōtiki Health Advisory Group. And we're also talking to the Iwi Māori Partnership Board, 
so uh, we're not going to put this on the table today, but I'll, I'll plant a little seed, um, is that they have agreed that they want to work in partnership with us, um, given the work that we're progressing, and off the back of Vision Carpety, which they think is an excellent starting point for some of the things that they're interested in. So this is part of the conversation, it is not the whole conversation. Okay. Yeah, so if there's ways that Councillor Warwick and myself can actually help with that relationship or help KK within the Otaki area, please do reach out um, because we don't want to make sure that Otaki is, you know, the, like what Councillor Kirby indicated that, you know, Otaki is left out and we don't want, if there's personalities within OHAG that we need to deal with, well, maybe we need to deal with them. You just make life a bit easier. Uh, may I just note that I, I think as we're just understanding some of the systems that operate in this community and we're, we are um, outlining and, and respecting roles and responsibilities of those different groups, I think um, it, we're just in those early stages. I'm not sure that we operationally are raising concerns um, that we think um, any further actions required. So I think the right conversations and, and engagement are, are happening in the beginning of a conversation, and over time we will see um, our system mature. So I think we're having the right conversations. It's just at a pace of it's where it's at right now. Um, we, we know that it, it's shifting in the right direction. Kirby, uh, no. I was just, just going to say that um, uh, I'm very aware personally of the the challenges that exist in that space and am advocating really strongly for Otaki uh, mm. in the spaces that I sit in around health. So thank you. Great. Uh, Mayor Janet. Yeah, just a couple, a couple of comments for me. First of all, I wanted to um, dive into the advocacy um, point. So we have worked together, the Mayor's Office and KHAG, with um, quite a lot of um, advocacy towards central government. So that's always an avenue as well, if, K if KHAG see an issue and they think we should be pushing that from a council level, always happy to write either a joint letter or a letter that's endorsed by... Kapiti Health Advisory Group. So that does happen. So if any elected members have any issues that they want to see progress, that's something that Sandra and I can discuss and we can um, have that joint approach. So um, the second thing I wanted to talk about was um, this joining up of the different uh, kaupapa that are happening across the district. And I would note, because it hasn't been explicitly said, that we are in the process of developing our health strategy. We already have our direction of travel. And so all this different kaupapa that's happening across the district can be drawn together through that process as well. Thank you. Councillor Coford. Oh, thanks, Madam Chair. Yes, so I attended the Otaki Network Forum meeting last Tuesday, and uh, KHAG, uh, was mentioned and I think the meeting was very confident that uh, there has been an outreach of uh, services and progress of services to Old Tacky and um, just look forward to um, progress in this space. Uh, people are pretty confident with that. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to just throw in a couple of comments. One is, can we please get away from this name KHEG? <laughs> because I don't think it's... Well, even CAG, I, look, I think this, you know, what we've seen through our work with Vision Carpety is that health is a, a, a very top of mind issue for people in our community. And I think this is something we can get a huge amount of community buy-in on. We need to keep the community informed of what we're doing in this space. And I think to have a, a name for this group that the community relates to would be really helpful in that process. And I would just implore... Uh, the advisory group to come up with something that's kind of, you know, uh, a bit more user-friendly and, uh, a, you know, something that, that people feel comfortable talking about <laughs> as opposed to uh, an, an abbreviation which, uh, you know, doesn't sound that, that great. So, and, and I think also to really um, put a lot of emphasis on communications out with the public <coughs> because... I think it's really important the public know what we are doing in this space. 
Uh, I guess the other things I'd like to say are just that this, we're in early stages of this, you know, in terms of developing the group, getting it set up, doing our health strategy, looking at how we connect in with other groups, and we need to get the basics in place before we, you know, leap too far ahead. But I think you've got a, the message today, hopefully, that we really appreciate the work that you're doing, and we're prepared to back you in uh, in, in the sense of any advocacy on, on issues when you feel the time is right to do that. And that's something you can discuss with uh, me, Holborough. So yeah, thank you very, very much indeed for the work that you're doing. Uh, Martin, would you like to have the right of, reply. right of reply on these? Yep, I'm happy to do a right of reply. Look, um, certainly agree with everything that was said. I think, Liz, you hit the nail on the head with regards to comms, but also um, the fact that this, um, although the, um, the Capital Health Advisory Group has been, around <laughs> has been around for a while, it's only recently that uh, it's been legitimised in a way that it can work more constructively mm. with the community. And I think the health strategy, as the Mayor's pointed out, is going to be a vehicle to pull pull a lot of these things together, and that includes Ōtaki as well. I've made a very, very solid point right from the beginning of, of, of ensuring that the Ōtaki conversation is part of this. Um, but um, And I guess where we're at at the moment is that relationship building aspect of thing. There's been a lot of uh, ups and downs in the past, shall we say, and uh, we want to work through that in a positive and constructive way so that we're on the same page as we move forward. Um, as such. One thing I did want to touch on, um, we, and um, Sandra brought it up, we had a very interesting presentation um, at the meeting on Monday uh, around cardio scanning offline, and it's quite interesting, you know, when we start looking at the technology aspect of things, the unintended consequences is, is, is potential offset in the climate space, because uh, this sort of digital approach, mm -hmm. the tens of thousands of hours that that could save with regards to travelling to Wellington Hospital and car and that sort of scenario, um, is something that hadn't really registered with me a heck of a lot, but you're talking substantial differences that can be made by utilising technology in a different way. So I really appreciated that person. I think I'm pretty sure you organised that person to come in and present. Uh, so, and I guess referring to how the different, Nigel, you're saying the different ways that we can tie this in, uh, by coming through the Social Sustainability Committee, we hear this stuff, we can see this stuff, and we can incorporate it into other aspects of what we're doing um, as part of our job around the table as well. Um, and that, to me, is a really good, positive thing. Um, that was about it for me. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, right. and um, appreciate the comments, everybody. All right, I'll put this to the vote. So just to be clear, we have in front of us, uh, A, approve, following endorsement by the Social Sustainability Committee, the work plan for the Capital Health Advisory Group for 24-25, and we no uh, B, we note that the budget consideration of up to $5,000 will be funded within baseline funding held by the Strategy and Growth Group. So I'll put that to the vote now. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Those against? It's carried. Thank you very much indeed. Alexander. And now we move to uh, item 9.1. And I'll invite Jason and the team to come forward for that. As the team come up to the table, um, I might just do a short intro to note. Um, we have um, Jason, who we're very familiar with, um, uh, coming to chat to us today around some omnibus plan changes. Um, with him we have Matt, and we've also got Esther um, down the end of the table. Welcome, Esther. Um, uh, she has uh, diligently worked on this, and I think, Esther, this is your first paper coming to council, isn't it? So well done. Um, uh, you have had information about the omnibus plan changes, um, and so today uh, we will step through the changes and we are seeking your decision. Um, there are several on the table, and um, our hope is to work through each one one by one, um, and then um, if you're happy um, with us, um, that we might take questions for each um, set, um, because there's a lot to get through if we leave it to all, all to the end. Yep, sure. If that sounds all right to everyone, I'll hand so over. So if you want the, um, these uh, items moved separately? Jason, yes, we're saying yes. We think that would be useful. Right. Great. Okay. So we might do each item and then the recommendation, the item and the recommendation, so that we can move through. Um, right. And so I'll hand over to Jason and Matt, and uh, we'll get going. Tēnā koutou katoa, 
Um, good morning, elected members. Um, firstly, let me just uh, introduce the team again. Um, to my left here, Matt Muspratt is the planner who's assisted us on this journey. Uh, his planner's reports are attachments three and four to the council report. Aster is in the district planning team and has also provided sterling support for this work, including working on the council report and assisting with negotiations with submitters in the latter stages. So thank you both for your contributions. Um, the report that you have here in front of you does cover a lot of matters. Um, and I'll, I'll partly apologise for that, but also I think I've probably saved you about nine separate uh, council uh, meetings uh, in the process, which is either a very sad thing if you love district planning or probably the best news you've had this year uh, otherwise. I won't assume which one it is. Um, great, there is more. Um, so let me just walk you through these, and maybe the most efficient way to do it is to actually make reference to the recommendations actually and, and use that as the kind of skeleton uh, from which I'll give you a brief overview. So if, if we turn to those recommendations and, and look at recommendation A, these two plan changes will be familiar to uh, you and indeed the, the council uh, that preceded you. They are around the accessible car parking plan change and the cycle parking. Now, both of these plan changes have got all the way through the steps of the process and are now at the last stage, and it's a pretty ceremonial stage. These plan changes have been through a draft consultation. Uh, there's been opportunity after public notification for submissions. There's been the opportunity for further submissions. We've had the negotiations. You've made decisions on the submissions and matters, uh, matters raised in submissions and decisions on the provisions themselves in December last year. Um, we had to open it up for appeals because the RMA says so, even though we'd negotiated with submitters and everybody was dancing down the road pretty happily together. Um, and I think I said at the time, uh, we're not expecting uh, appeals because it would be rather odd if we had. And of course, we didn't get any appeals. So now we're at the last stage and the decision that we're seeking is for you to uh, give that final approval, at which point, uh, or after which, we will go and do some fairly stock standard things like a public notice and, and getting a seal affixed, which is very 1800s kind of language, but that's what the RMA says we have to do. Um, and that's the end of the deal. They both, those plan changes get absorbed into the operative district plan and they become the provisions and that's the end of the road. So, we'll, <laughs> so what we'll do, we'll, if we take questions on A only, mm -hmm. and then we can move A, and just we'll, we'll just move them through them one by one in that way, is that, so is there anything else you want to say on A? So we'll take questions on A. Any questions on A? Councillor Halliday, you've got your light on? I have, I've got a question. Yep. Right. <laughs> um, look, thank you for that, uh, Jason. It's, it's more of a, a clarity around this. This has been imposed on us by central government, is that correct, with regards to removing of the um, uh, parking and, and, um, and that sort of stuff? Is, is These plan changes were a response to something that was imposed on us yep. that had an inadvertent consequence, and yep. that was the removal uh, of minimum car parking requirements, which Council was required to take out of the district plan um, some time ago by the National Policy Statement for Urban Development and that had the inadvertent consequence by the way the district plan was drafted of also knocking out uh, minimum accessible parking requirements and minimum cycle parking requirements. So this is a response to that inadvertent consequence. Yep, no, that's good. I guess my concern is, is with um, change of government, we're seeing a lot of things being reverted back, um, so to speak. Is there any, have you heard any has there been any indicator of that happening in regards to this? Because that removing of the parking requirements seemed like a very interesting, um, a very, should we say, very interesting uh, approach to uh, high density, um, if you like. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of people would disagree and say, look, you need the car parking in there. Is this something the government's likely to turn around on us? We haven't had any signals as okay. such. I was just curious about that. Is that the end of your question? I'm just looking at, I've just got one point. 
on page 37 of the agenda, um, the amendments to be made to the um, uh, district plan, uh, number one standards, starts off with saying disability persons car parks. I just noticed that generally the wording has been accessible car parks. Uh, just wondering whether that wording needs to be updated on there at all. We can look at that. We do have the ability under clause 20 of schedule one of the RMA to make um, changes to correct minor errors. So if there are any um, wording changes like that, um, we, we can take a look at that. Yep. Other than that, that's me, thank you. Any other questions? No, don't appear to be any, so I'll move from the chair that council approves plan changes 1A, accessible car parking, and 1C, cycle parking under clause 17 of schedule one of the Resource Management Act 1991 as set out in attachments one and two respectively. Do I have a seconder for that? Shall, uh, Councillor Warwick, all those in favour? Aye. 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 Those against? That's carried. Uh, okay, moving on to B. Recommendation B, thank you. So now we're moving into a different batch of omnibus plan changes that are um, a little bit further behind, but not that much further behind 1A and 1C. And the first one of those that we're going to talk about is proposed plan change 1L. Now that is a plan change which uh, <coughs> proposes to rezone a number of council-owned sites. Most of those sites are sites that were vested in council through subdivision processes for the purposes of creating a little pocket park or an accessible little uh, avenue from one place to another. Um, there are also within that plan change rezonings of two uh, park areas, um, existing parks. Uh, one of those is uh, the toilet block and uh, car park area of Jim Cook Park. Um, and the other one is McLean Park um, down in Paraparaumu Beach. And so recommendation B is about just that, that latter part of proposed plan change 1L. That latter part, the one about McLean Park, is the one that attracted opposing submissions. Um, it actually attracted one opposing primary submission, but then upon publicly notifying the summary of decisions requested, 14 further submissions piled in, and also uh, they supported that one opposing submission. Therefore, you could say that there are one plus four, 15 opposing submitters and further submitters. Great maths, thank you. Yeah, yeah. there's no stopping me. Um, so what recommendation B is about, really, is about saying there is an efficient way to allow the remainder, the balance of those uh, council site rezonings to proceed directly to a council decision. That's going to be a part of recommendation C, but you have to, in order to get there first, <coughs> for plan change 1L, you would have to make this decision to withdraw the part of plan change 1L where there were opposing submitters seeking to or submitter plus further submitters that were seeking to be heard. Now you have the ability to make that surgical intervention through Clause 8D of Schedule 1 of the RMA. That allows you to go in, into a plan change, withdraw a part of it, and then if the rest of it doesn't need a hearing, which would be the case here, you can then go ahead and make a decision on provisions, matters, rates and submissions. That's part of your recommendation C. But as I say, we can't get there for plan change 1L until we deal with, there has to be an order of things here, that's why it's B then C. So I think um, that's probably hopefully enough explanation yep, about what yep. B's about, happy to take questions. Thank you. We've got a question from uh, Councillor Cooper online. Are you there Councillor Cooper? Yeah, um, yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Oh great. Um, I just, it's not really a question, it's more of a, um, a comment and, and it, um, around this, uh, in respect to the McLean Park management strategy, which I think is due for review in 2027. Now, is it correct, Jason, that the, um, the McLean Park management strategy, when it was had public consultation and um, went forward oh, a few years ago now, I think it's a 10-year plan, so um, six or seven years ago, 
that um, that won awards for its consultation and engagement with the, the, the public. Um, I guess that's a question. Just, yeah. oh. um, just a question, Councillor Cooper. Were you one yep. of the submitters on this uh, uh, this proposed change? Or your wife? Uh, prior to prior to being elected, I may have been. So I, I, I think you might need to excuse yourself from the discussion. Could I, I have some confirmation? Well, you need to declare a conflict. Yes. You can still discuss, but, yeah, but not well, yeah. vote on this one. Yeah, and that, that, that's fine. Um, Are you I, declaring I, a conflict of interest? Um, if that's the right protocol, I can declare a conflict. Thank you. Or a perceived, a perceived conflict. So I don't think there's a conflict, but yeah, if the, the table does, that's fine. You, you, don't, you don't have to declare a conflict, but I'm just asking you if you are, right? Yeah. So no, you no, no, are I'm happy to declare a conflict and, and not vote, abstain from the vote. Okay, thank you. But, but I am happy um, if I can speak to it. Yep, sure. That's fine. Yeah, yeah and, and, all, and, and all I'd say is that... Um, uh, the appropriate place for any any changes to McLean Park designation would, in my view, um, would come when the McLean Park management strategy is due for review in 2027. So I, if, if I could vote, which I can't, uh, no, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. But the, the appropriate place, um, so I think the correct procedure is being carried out considering the, the McLean Park management strategy. Right, so did you wish Sorry. to repeat your question to uh, Jason? At this yes. point, yes. Would you like to just go ahead and repeat that question because we were yeah. So the question, Jason, was um, in terms of the McLean Park management strategy, um, public engagement and that process that was held up as a sort of exemplar process for the council in terms of the management of that park. Would that be correct? Oh, look, sorry, um, Councillor, it's not a the, the consultation on that process is not one that I'm familiar with. Awesome, thank you. That, that's all I've got. Thank you, thank you. I think um, Sean Mallon might have a response to that. Thank you, Sean. So uh, the council is correct. Yes, that that um, engagement process and that management plan process was. I do think we we did receive significant recognition for the process. Not mm -hmm. sure yep. if we won an award, but it was certainly um, mm -hmm. recognised in the extent of of the engagement and the quality of the. The output. Thank you. Right. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Team. Cheers. Okay, Councillor Halliday. Yeah, look, I just building on what Dan was just talking to, just for clarity, um, I'm picking when they review that plan um, that that wouldn't impact on the designation of the park as such as part of that process because you'd have to go through a consultative process around that. Would that be correct? I, I would imagine so, but I, I must admit it's not a matter that I feel like I'm. No, 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 it's, and it's not, not really the question I was going to pose anyway. Look, uh, my, my question was, in regards to withdrawing that, if there were to be changes down there, it could be, uh, that, that could happen in theory through a resource consent process. Would that be right? That's right. The, the natural open space zoning that is uh, currently the zoning for the land and which would still apply if council does choose to withdraw does allow for resource consents to be applied for. Um, indeed, there are actually permitted activities that don't require resource consent as well. Yep. Um, but yes, it does allow for resource consents to be applied for for a range of activities. Um, there are some rules that are more enabling of some activities than others. And, uh, so there are um, certain activities you can apply for a restricted discretionary or a discretionary um, or a non-complying. Uh, that is the suite of, of rules, I think, from memory. In, in the plan, but yes, your ability to undertake activities in the park, yes, you can apply for consent. Um, cool. Yes. <clears throat> I guess I'd just be flagging as ward council, I think Glenn was in as well, and maybe, well, I think Cathy, I can't speak for her, that uh, we'll certainly be endorsing the removal of this as per what's written there as well. <laughs> a little bit of a, 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 a tale from Te here involved with this one here as well, so yeah. it just helps tidy that one off too. Councillor Wilson. Yeah, I just wanted to um, <clears throat> clarify a point around um, Councillor Cooper and conflict of interest. 
the I think we tread on very dangerous ground when statements made or submissions made by an elected member prior to becoming an elected member could even be a suggestion that they uh, that they have a conflict of interest and ultimately the only person of, and and we have Simpson Grierson who've given us this opinion and others the only person who can determine if they have a conflict of interest is the elected member themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> in terms of conflict of interest, I think it's really important that we don't direct that we don't direct elected members that they have a conflict of interest. Um, that it, it should never be directed, in my view. Um, just putting that out there, because we will have a lot of these things, particularly when it comes to planning, where people will who have taken an active interest in their community will have made some submission somewhere along the line. The big difference once you are an elected member, in fact, elected mm. members shouldn't be making submissions anyway, but mm. quite frankly, but um, <coughs> anyway, that's out there for... Mm. Um, uh, Christopher Van would like to, like to make a comment in relation to that. Thank you. Um, and, and I think I just um, wanted um, to, I guess, share um, some information from an operational perspective that one of the things that I think we try and balance when we are putting advice on the table to you is to ensure that you're aware of um, risk that might come um, from decisions. And in this situation, um, uh, uh, the counterpoint to, of course, you need to determine whether you will state a conflict of interest or someone else, is that um, if you didn't state a conflict of interest and a decision is made, it could be up for judicial review. And we conceivably would have to go through a process and pay further um, ratepayers' funds um, on an issue that um, could be managed at this table. So from our end, we would always um, signal to you that risk and leave that up to you to make a decision. So just mm -hmm. popping that on the table. And if I just further comment that I think it, it is our duty to point out potential conflicts of interest, that somebody may have a conflict of interest around the table. It is still their choice as to whether they wish to declare that. And uh, I hope, hopefully I did make the point that Councillor Cooper had an option uh, to declare a conflict of interest or not, so and he has declared one, so yeah, we'll leave it at that. But uh, yeah, I take your point that yeah, it is a, a, a it is up to the council uh, member, ca the council themselves, to determine that at the end of the day. But I think yeah, we just have to be aware. Right. Uh, any further questions on this item? In that case, I will. Move that Council withdraws under Clause 8D of that schedule that part of Proposed Plan Change 1L, Council Site Rezonings relating to McLean Park. Do we have a second of that? Uh, Mayor Holbra, uh, no debate on that, I presume. So I'll put that to the vote, and noting uh, Councillor Cooper's abstention from that based on conflict, potential conflict of interest. So all those in favour? Those, right. those against? That's carried. Moving on to recommendation C. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. So, so now, having made that decision, plan change 1L kind of moves into the pack of four that we are recommending you make decisions on provisions and matters raised in submissions on. So this, just to step back a sec, this was the stage that you were at in December last year with plan changes 1A and 1C. Now you're at that stage for the plan changes listed in C1 to C4. So just to briefly recap, um, we've, we've already talked about a plan change 1L, I won't recap on, on C4, but um, in terms of C1 to C3, so plan change 1D, that reclassified three streets in Parapara Umu in the transport hierarchy, and, and that sounds like bureaucratic gobbledygook, I get that. What does that mean? Basically, we have rules around development that are tied to where in a uh, where in that hierarchy a street is at, and so if if it's in the wrong place in the hierarchy, either the rules are going to be overly constraining on development, imposing unnecessary constraints, or they might not be 
actually imposing the right kind of constraints and that can create safety issues. Um, and the example, and particularly the one that's applicable here, is around a rule that requires uh, uh, vehicles to be able to um, safely exit a property instead of them having to back on to a super busy street there's, there's a requirement to be able to make sure that the development requires that they can actually come out frontwards. And so that's really what Plan Change 1D was trying to do, is to move uh, Arafata Road and to Tanakai Street up the hierarchy, recognising their busy streets and that extra bit of safety is required, and actually drop Ventnor Drive down the hierarchy because it, it was an error and it really doesn't need that level of um, extra uh, obligation. So that's plan change uh, 1D um, and the recommendation for that plan change is to is to keep it as it was uh, as it was notified because there is no reason that was uh, that council would want to do anything different. Um, there were no opposing submissions, no one wishing to be heard, no negotiations with submitters required in that sense. So that one's pretty straightforward I would recommend. Um, Plan change 1F, which is there as C2, and I guess I am recommending, uh, Madam Chair, that we maybe progress this as, as a bulk set rather than... Yes, sure. Yeah. Um, so 1F is a plan change which makes a couple of tweaks to rule eco R6 and also adds a trade to the key indigenous species list. The tweaks to the rule Eco R6 were in response to an unfortunate circumstance, very much an implementation issue, where a rule which was really intended, a controlled activity rule, for people who needed to do um, some rather what you might call um, very necessary modifications to a tree because of, for example, a, a risk to property or, or to people, Unfortunately, there was an example where it was able to be used to remove tens and tens of trees, which coincidentally, from memory, followed the pathway of a driveway that someone was looking to create through an ecosite. Mm -hmm. Now, that was not what the intention of that rule was, and so the tightenings that have been proposed through this plan change are all about making sure that it actually goes back to the policy intent. It's, it's a... A, con a controlled activity pathway, meaning consent must be granted in a circumstance where you really need to get the consent and get that work going, and there's no question about that. Um, and I should add, and this is highlighted in the report, that there is a permitted activity rule for trimming in emergency type situations as well, where you don't need a consent at all. Um, and then the other part of that plan change was to add coastal kanaka into that species list, and that just recognises that it's a like a little dwarfy version of kanuka as opposed to the the big kanuka that uh, you, you'll all be familiar with. And unless it gets that special recognition of being small, those little ones would not be safe um, because they'd all be judged against the heightened dimension of of the big kanuka that you're familiar with. So that's about protecting a, a valued indigenous species. Um, and finally, plan change 1K was a very, very small, simple plan change to align that, uh, the relevant uh, signage rule, so that it aligned with national regulations around election signage. Um, and that's it. It was as simple as that. And so 1F did, I should go back and, and clarify, did uh, end up with some negotiations with submitters leading to some uh, changes. Those changes are described in the report uh, in summary in paragraph 24 of the council report, or staff report, um, but plan change 1K remains as it was notified. Um, so in summary, Across those four plan changes, 1D is recommended to proceed as notified, 1K is recommended to proceed as notified, 1L, you've just made a decision to clip out the claim part, the balance of it is recommended to proceed as notified, and 1F, noting those amendments that have been um, 
recommended to you as a result of, of considering submissions, 1F is recommended to proceed with those amendments. Thanks, Jason. Any questions? Yeah, just a, <clears throat> just a clarification around the election signage. As, as a person who has never put an election sign in the wrong place, so blame, <laughs> blameless, blameless as I am, but I have seen people do that, some dodgy stuff. So is this, this is, I can't see in a real sense any difference between the size of signs that were allowed locally and nationally. Uh, um, so were we operating, uh, d was our plan um, out of step or was theirs? So during the election period, and, and Matt, I will get you to call me on this if I get any of this technically wrong, but during the election period, the national regulations apply. And, and I believe the rule has a note to that effect. And, and they talk about three square metres. Now, the rule was intended to apply outside the election period if somebody wanted to have a sign that kicked in a bit earlier, is, is, is the way I interpret it. And it talked about um, two metres square. And so all of this, all that this plan change does is align, so it changes two to three, so that it's three. Yeah, it's like a sign, Councillor Wilson. <laughs> that would achieve no alignment, um, <laughs> Councillor. So yeah, that, that's all that it does. It's as simple as that. Is that right, Matt? You agree with that? Thank you. Councillor Pavano. Through the chair. Mm. Thank you. So I've got a couple of questions in relation to um, mm -hmm. IF and then IL. So it's great to see that there's two species of kanuka that have been added to the eco table. I'm I, I'm hearing on the grapevine that there are individual individual species that people want to add to the table, but they've been told they can't do it because, uh, you know, it's got to go through the district plan process. Is this the right um, place to be doing that, or is there another mechanism to do that? So... Uh I'll, I'll take a, a very um, kind of wide view of, of your question, Councillor, because we get we do get suggestions, well, directly answering your question, uh, we did get a submission from, I think it was Forrest and Bird, who was interested in, in going large with a review of that table. Um, and, and our response was, look, you may well have a point, um, but this isn't actually the plan change that was trying to be a fulsome review or indeed the the way that we make sure that the district plan fully gives effect to the national policy statement on indigenous biodiversity. That, that's not what this plan change was. Um, that's not to say there shouldn't be uh, such a review and there will need to be such a fulsome plan change. It's just not this plan change. It's something that we need to build into our forward work programme. Um, we also do get feedback from time to time where somebody has um, a notable tree that they would like us to include in the notable tree list uh, or indeed a grove of trees that they might consider should be considered a basically a significant natural area is the normal language but we we talk about I think current ecological sites so all of those things are possible they just, this plan change had the very narrow scope that it had. And I guess when it comes to when what when might we choose to review all of those things, my answer would be we would want to schedule a plan change that gives full effect to the National Policy Statement for Indigenous Biodiversity, and that would be the plan change to do that. So how far away is that, do you know? It's, I guess, looking like with the timing of the of the Indigenous Biodiversity National Policy Statement and uh, it's probably like the next batch following the batch that is, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about when we get to recommendation F. So it's it's on the radar, We've, we, we have recognised it in the longer term programme, it's just not in the, the short, short term. Just, okay. I just want to Thank add you. to this to say um, over the next 12 months we will be coming back to you and looking uh, 
well, effectively assessing um, some different areas that you may have interest in, and we think it's important that you can look across that suite and prioritise, rather than identifying single, I, I won't call them issues, but single opportunities, so that we can think as a whole, what does that look like over time, and, and be clear with people that will be looking at those over time, and they might shift um, in priority, um, but that will that will be tabled, um, so that, and we will discuss that with you, so you get a chance to inform it and make sure that we've got all the things that are important to cover off um, on the list. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so the other um, one in, in relation to this um, plan change, and Jason touched on it, was about the serious harm um, to buildings and people. So um, from my memory, when we landed our um, intensification plan change, there was a conversation around how how much protection was um, afforded to trees in terms of building, and which is, which is actually quite narrow. So I, I'm just wondering how much protection some of these tr trees get when a tree can be built virtually right next to, then it is damaged or dies, and then they cut it out so they achieve their objective. What protection is there... Um, for those trees, and I suppose the other thing is too, one assumes that if a building is, if someone wants to build a, a house or a, a building and there is a tree there, that that is a completely different set of uh, criteria they need to consider in terms of um, uh, looking at that tree. There's two parts to that, really. Yeah. I might give you a chance to have a bit of a think, Matt, about whether there might be some aspects of that question that you, you might like to answer, but uh, ahead of time. Um, look, uh, Council gets feedback probably both ways on on this matter. Um, you, as you can imagine, uh, when somebody wishes to modify a tree on their property and they find out that a resource consent is required, that can be, despite the fact that many of these trees are noted on limbs, nonetheless an unwelcome, uh, what they view to be, an impingement on their rights as property owners. So we certainly need to balance as a council um, how, how we provide an avenue for people to be able to, um, I guess, enjoy their property and be safe, uh, whilst also recognising that uh, both individual trees and groves of trees have an important part to play in our, um, our basic district ecosystem, really. So that's that's the balance that we've been trying to strike. Matt, in terms of the details of the rules and councillor's question. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Um, so the rule the rule manager's modification um, and the definition of modification, although there's no setback from from a tree for buildings. Modification does involve um, activities within the drip line of a, of a tree, so that um, provides some, you know, it's not like you can put a building right up against a tree. There is a drip line. Um, works within the drip line. Yeah. So, but that involves compaction, sealing or removal of soil, uh, drilling or excavation, or discharge of toxic substances within the drip line. So... So that's excluding those. So you cannot do those things within that time, that, in that, um, that zone. Yeah, so rules that manage modification to that vegetation includes that, that includes those things. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so now I just want to, just a very quick question in relation to um, 1L. I just, so I actually don't think I was here um, in December when um, this was considered or discussed. I just want to um, understand that by changing um, IL, that it doesn't necessarily change, that doesn't change the plan use and allow buildings to be built in this land. So we... We've actually had, again, this is one of those step back sort of moments, firstly. Um, one L and plan change two. Think about those two plan changes just for a moment. Both of these plan changes have included rezoning of council-owned sites, but they've rezoned in different directions. 
Plan Change 2 did actually rezone some council owned sites and made them into general residential zones so that they could be used for housing purposes down the line. This plan change does the other, sends other sites in, in the other direction and actually uh, zones them from, in some cases, in fact in most cases, from general residential zone to an open space zone or a natural open space zone. Now, that's not necessarily precluding their future use for housing, but I think it does send a pretty clear signal that the, the intent of council is to want to utilise that land for some kind of parky type purpose. <coughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Yeah, had a couple of questions. One about is um, is how autonomous uh, we are able to be if there's var variations to a national policy statement and given the current government and the influence of, say, Shane Jones, like goodbye Freddie and doesn't appear to have a great deal of respect for the biodiversity. So how, how constrained are we by national policy statements in our own thing? Is the broad, is a broader question? Yeah, we must give effect to them. So we are considerably constrained by them. Right, okay. And in terms of, in terms of time lag, so if a national policy statement comes out and says something that runs right across our current, our current um, biodiversity protections, What's the t what's the time frame before we have to institute and and do yeah. are we we would still presumably be required to consult? So you would look inside the national policy statement for a timeline, yeah. uh, and typically national policy statements will say um, by twenty twenty x council will notify a plan change that. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, the National Policy Statement for Indigenous Biodiversity does set a timeline. I, I don't want to give you that date right now because I'll get it wrong, but it does set it out for a couple of years uh, in advance. Um, there, you, you'll be aware that the current Amendment Act, the First Amendment Act, did include um, some provisions that were basically looking to freeze out um, councils from putting SNA, significant natural areas, uh, in their plans anew yeah. for a period of time while they, I guess, work things through. But we've already got significant natural areas in our district plan through the good work of past councils. Um, and there's nothing that's been signalled that I'm aware of from uh, the national level that means uh, invalidates those or, or suggests that we should not be implementing plan provisions which have the protections to keep those in place. So we're fine with what we've got. I think it's wise to wait and see rather than leaping in and doing early adoption of a national policy statement that might be subject to change in the next wee while. I think it's wise to wait and see how things play out and move to implement when the land is a little less rocky. Yep. And I think that's what we will recommend to you down the line with advice about the forward work program. Yep, that sounds wise. Um, to Councillor Vernal's point, uh, I know in with plan change two, there was significant disquiet in the Waikanae Garden District. Mm -hmm. And we were told at the time that that area, oh, don't worry, because it'll be protected because you won't, you know, because there's so many trees there, it'd be really difficult for people to build in, in there anyway. I'm not entirely convinced by that argument. Um, but the, so that provision that was in Plan Change 2, that, um, so what protections are there? In, in that area, because you might yeah. you might be building on a property that doesn't affect trees on your property, but may affect trees on somebody else's property, like future shade or whatever it happens to be. So I guess the point that we were making back in those days was 
plan change, plan change two was not looking to change anything when it comes to the degree of protection for notable trees uh, or the degree of protection for significant natural areas that, that's already in the plan or the protection for key indigenous tree species which there's provisions to protect as well. Um, that was the point we were we were trying to make and when it came to the Waikanae Garden Precinct because there's such a preponderance, um, a, a high concentration of those things in that area, it, it therefore comes to pass that looking at that area there's a lot of hurdles for people to jump and a lot of uncertainty about whether they'll be able to jump high enough to convince council that they should be granted consent. So those protections lived on and plan change two didn't weaken them. Okay. And my final point is about um, the, the, we've got a, a live case at the moment where if, it, if it's not residential, somehow it magically becomes commercial. And um, the, the instance I'm thinking about in particular uh, is um, Te Kahatui up in uh, Rikirangi. And that's... Um, it's not deemed, apparently it's not deemed to be residential, it, so therefore it's deemed to be commercial. And, and while this is a live conversation, I'm just wondering, in general, is that how it falls? So if something isn't, doesn't, isn't in an area that's currently zoned residential, um, is it automatically become um, commercial? And does and, and is there and is there sufficient room wiggle room in our plan to be able to negotiate through perhaps what might be called exceptional circumstances? I think I can only give you a very generic answer because I'm not familiar with the yeah, issue no, that you're talking answer, about. Um, and that is that all land in the district, I think, barring land that's subject to the river corridor flood hazard, is subject to zoning of some sort. And um, in, in a similar way that we've just had a conversation about the natural open space zone and the rules there and what it sort of enables and makes slightly less enabling, every zone does that. Uh, every zone has a particular purpose. It's trying to encourage a particular set of activities and probably discourage uh, another set. And, and that goes back to the philosophy of zoning back in, you know, when someone dreamed up district planning was a good idea. Um, which is basically saying things like you want to be grouping like with like, you don't want to be um, necessarily putting in an activity in the middle of another activity where you're going to create reverse sensitivity issues. I'm not sure I can really answer much more than that, but... I think that's a no, that's I'm okay. I mean, I know this, this is, it's a, it's a live discussion, so I don't want to yeah. go down that track, but I just I was just, just getting a general I was going to use a, a different example, yeah. um, which I think has previously um, been discussed, which was um, uh, just over road down there, our industrial area where um, entities like the bond store are, are operating, and the idea that they currently, under our plan, really are not able to do retail as well as industrial, we'll be coming back to you, as I said, over the next 12 months to go, hey, are there some opportunities to go, do we need some precinct-like styled things where maybe here you, you can do industrial retail, it's not permitted currently, but it could be something that we say, hey, this is something we want to do, and we would look at how we do that. So uh, we are looking at the issues that come up, we will be coming back to you to think about are there some opportunities, are there some themes coming through, and we will discuss that with you. So I can perhaps, um, in addition to what Jason's um, just said, pop that on the table for you. Okay. Community board member Larrathy. Right. Um, to treat this as a learning experience, okay? So um, a while ago, Jason, you referred to property owners and trees and said that despite the information being on their limbs, so my ears pricked up at that. Yeah. <coughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> right, so the property owner is assumed to know that that tree is protected by virtue of the fact that it's on their limbs, is that correct? So what we do put on limbs is if there's a notable tree 
and uh, keeping in mind that the notable trees were introduced I believe, and Matt, again, because Matt does have a good understanding of the history of the district plan, thankfully, um, I, I believe they were introduced at least uh, in 2012, if not, maybe some of them may have been earlier, or way before, way before that. Okay, so notable trees have been on limbs largely unchanged. I won't say there hasn't been any changes, because there have been some minor ones I would characterise them at for quite some time. Ecological sites have been on limbs for um, also a pretty reasonable length of time. Yeah, same, same amount of time. Same amount of time. At least since 2003 when I first started. Yeah, so Matt's just said at least um, since 2003. So, so these things are have been on there for a while. Um, I guess, Councillor, so you probably got a oh, sorry, um, community board member. Um, you may have a follow-up question, I suspect. Probably, yes. <laughs> so um, so it, can there be a situation where somebody purchases a property and a tree changes it, it becomes noted, or the ecological, whatever. So in this Kanuka, small Kanuka example, will there be situations where people have small kanuka on their properties that they're affected by that change it's possible that when it comes to the key indigenous tree species list which is a different yep. situation than the others that yes they that is possible and that notification comes by limb not for the key indigenous trees okay. because that those provisions are around once a, uh, so if you've got a species on your property and it's reached a certain level of maturity in terms of height or girth, um, then it, it becomes protected as a result of that. Can I just note that um, Schedule 8, Notable Trees, if you search up KCDC Notable Trees, um, a list comes up. It's not a long list, um, but it has the section, it has details about the tree, and that is the notable trees list. Yeah. So, yeah, so if somebody wanted to add a notable tree mm -hmm. to that list, it would go through a Schedule 1 plan change mm -hmm. process. Similarly, if there was a new significant natural area, that would need to go through a Schedule 1 process. And, of course, there would be consultation with the landowner mm -hmm. in both cases. Right. So that's what, I'm cons what I was just curious about in, in terms of are we getting into a situation where someone comes a cropper because they didn't know that there was something on their limb. So, so should when, there be... When there was an assumption that they would know because it's there. Yeah, so again, I'll just differentiate. Yeah. What what would go on a limb is a notation about a notable tree mm. or about whether there's a significant natural area uh, on that property, on a part of that property. The key indigenous trees, we don't have the location of every single key indigenous tree that has reached a particular height and girth to merit protection. Matt, have you got anything you want to add there? Yeah, um, a couple of things. So to protect um, indigenous trees in urban areas, and there's a definition for tree, um, they have to be specifically listed in the district plan uh, in, in the schedule. And there's, there's a, a massive schedule of, of those trees in urban areas. Um, and generally, they are within significant natural areas already. So, um, yeah, so the change would apply to non-urban areas uh, where a tree is not at, was not within a significant natural area, which um, if you look at the case study attached to the Section 32, um, most of these trees, um, where they where they occur naturally, are in a group, and would I would expect them typically to be within an SNA. But um, yeah, there may be trees that that aren't. Just like any other tree on, on that list, um, we don't know where all the trees are of all, all mm. the different species, um, unless they're in an SNA. You'd, yeah. My question's more specifically about limbs from the property owner's point of view, but we can probably leave it there. I'm just curious about that particular issue, but I'll leave it. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, oh, sorry, Community Board Member. I'll, I'll take, take the promotion. Thanks. Thanks. Um, <laughs> not so much a question, but just um, some real life examples of several of the points that have been raised. Uh, first is um, to the notice about significant indigenous vegetation. I have a property that is overhung by uh, some koikoes, which are protected. And when the process happened, we received a letter saying, we think you have, we need to come and inspect. And they did. Fortunately, they only overhang my property. They don't land on it. But there was that sort of information then. And um, so it was, it was notified to existing. Uh, the second point is to Councillor Wilson's um, talk about vegetation in the Waikanae uh, garden area. Um, I invite people to have a look on Google Earths at 14 Narara, which is covered in trees, um, and then drive past it, and it is um, just bay root, basically. It's been flattened, all the trees are cut down, um, and I think there's 20 lots being applied for on that property. And the third point is to Matt's um, discussion about significant vegetation on land that is not urban and is not a, um, I forget the terminology, but a, a, a protected yeah. area. Um, we, as you know, I'm doing a, a subdivision in Otahanga. We had um, significantly large kanuka trees and they were all protected, identified as being protected and any of the work we took out, we had to mitigate by planting, I think, uh, 10 plants for every one taken out. So that that's just examples of how the process works or doesn't. Thank you, Mr Mansell. Councillor Coford. Oh, thank you. Um, just a question about ecological sites. Uh, there's one running through all tacky on the escarpment, and um, I just want to steer us to trimming branches. Can can you touch that? And also, I know of someone who grew uh, some native trees on that site, on his own site, and um, wants to now cut them down because they're in the wrong place. Where do they stand there? Okay. Um. Sorry. So again, probably just need to maybe just slightly return back to yeah, what the actual plan change is doing. Uh, can we take that yeah. offline, Councillor Coford? Because that's a very specific question. Oh, it was a general yeah. uh, maintenance and trimming um, yeah. question. Um, just going back to Councillor Wilson's uh, question too about um, was it a vague zone um, defaulting automatically to commercial? Or I don't think that would be possible would it, without a um, some sort of plan change, some sort of zoning change. Yeah. And uh, just a question about signs, election signs um, could could be a possible one in the air, um, a, an aerial banner. <laughs> <laughs> Is that limited <laughs> to three square metres? Because you won't see it. No. <laughs> yeah. Conflict of interest on that one. <laughs> I think you're more familiar with the air <laughs> issues than I am, <laughs> Councillor. Okay, are there any more? Oh, uh, Councillor Halliday. Yeah, look, just a bit of clarity. I've just been looking up the district plan and I noticed that there's actually key indigenous trees actually on the district plan mm. as well. So the ones that are on the limbs, is that just a reflection yeah. of what's on the district plan or is there additional ones? You're right, there are. There are also generic protections that apply to trees mm. that reach a certain yeah, yeah, height and, and right. girth. But so if it's listed in the district plan, whether it's key indigenous tree, notable tree, significant natural area, the only way to change that is through a Schedule 1 process, and there would always be engagement with the landowner as part of that. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. So that's cool. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Kirby. If it's a listed tree. In the oh, mine's just a, probably an observation that uh, property owners, a reminder for probably for property owners that we need to be aware of what's on our limbs. Would that be a fair question? Yeah, absolutely. And of course, typically, if you're going to do a, a significant development on your land, you're going to engage a resource management professional who will do a 
hopefully a good job of, of reviewing the district plan and all of the chapters that might apply and we'll be able to advise the landowner about the sorts of whether or not everything's permitted activity or whether they need a resource consent and there'll be engagement with council along the way. So due diligence is usually triggered by that kind of larger development and, and that's where a professional will usually be engaged. I think the concern probably with that that Mr Larisi was pointing out was um, sometimes landowners just do something and it's not considered a quote a significant development but there's a tree that's in the way mm. uh, and they're not aware of what's on their limb and they mm. chop a tree down um, mm. and then get in trouble as a result because they don't know or do they um, because they don't know what's on their limb and to get a limb costs them quite a bit of money there you go, $387, which can be a barrier to some landowners. So I just, you know, I, th I think that is a, something we need to be aware of as council, is that yep. sometimes those things can happen um, in as much as, yeah. Yep, and an issue for every council throughout the land, I would have thought. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Mayor Holbrook? Yeah, I'm happy to move recommendations C1 through 4. Yep. Seconder for that. Councillor Coford. Any yeah, debate? Just, just a brief a brief comment. I think we're getting tangled up in limbs. Actually, mm -hmm. if you're going to cut down a tree that's native and seems significant, or it's a small mm -hmm. kanuka, mm -hmm. the thing to do is just check with council, yeah. Yeah. and they'll be able to advise. Mm -hmm. I think the the issue of limbs is being raised a little out of context sometimes at the moment. We're getting a bit... Mm -hmm. uh, we're a bit sensitised to limbs. A bit sensitised to limbs at the moment. Yep. Thank you for that. All right, uh, I'll put that to the vote. Uh, recommendation C. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Those against? That's carried. <coughs> now, I'm just aware that it's 11 o'clock. Are people happy to continue on, or would you like a short break? Hmm? Box on, Box on right. It's an incentive. If you want a cup of tea, we have to keep this moving. <laughs> so, Jason, would you like to introduce uh, recommendation D, please? Thank you. So um, recommendation D is about um, basically some space that council did provide staff to do some work in an area way back in October 2021. And that area was to look at whether or not the district plan and some particular bylaws had some unhelpful overlaps, duplications, contradictions that needed to be ironed out uh, through a, a plan change. So... <coughs> We looked at that and we looked at three bylaws in particular and in paragraphs uh, 40 to and 41 of the council report there's a brief summation of what we found. There's also a um, memo that's attached as attachment five. The upshot of the review was that there weren't any issues that we had identified that merited a Schedule 1 plan change. We did find some issues that we have already corrected through some minor technical amendments to the bylaws. Um, and there was a transport rule and a minor issue identified, but it, it was not considered to be problematic enough at this time to proceed with a plan change to address it. It's the sort of issue that would likely also need, in my view, um, some pretty serious consultation uh, with the likes of trucking companies, etc. Um, and so the upshot was um, we are recommending to you that that particular plan change, which was identified as a possible plan change back in October 2021, does not proceed to notification. Any questions? Happy to move. Thank you. Seconder. Okay, Councillor Halliday, uh, all those in favour? Aye. 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 Those against? Carried. Recommendation E, that we note further consultation will include will occur on draft plan change 1E before December 2024. So this yes. is this is just a noting recommendation and a, and a brief mm -hmm. progress update. Um, essentially, this plan change deals with some kind of what you might think of as um, 
nice ideas that w were put in the plan um, many years ago that just didn't work too good. And they were around some development incentives that were, as I say, well-intentioned, trying to get sort of ecologically friendly things happening. Um, but we're worded in, in quite a problematic way and they've never really led to much in the way of benefit. So uh, this was again part of that suite of work that Council back in October 2021 20, gave us the mandate to do. We have already done quite a bit of work on this and there's already been consultation on a draft. Um, but since that time we've had uh, a new national policy statement, the one that we've already talked about today, the Indigenous Biodiversity, and our intention um, using the mandate that we got back in October 21 to consult on a draft is to actually consult on another draft that gets updated to deal with that national policy statement and also does give us a chance to have a think about the feedback we got the first time we put a draft out. So we're, we're intending to put a new and improved draft out later this year and the idea is we'll come back to you next year for a approval to notify a plan change that improves those provisions, makes sure that they're legal, because there's some issues around that as well, and uh, make sure that they give effect to those higher order documents. So that's pretty much the update on that. Thank you. Councillor Pravanov, do you have a question? Yes, so, so through the chair, I was going to make a number of comments that have been made by a number of elected members around um, the table in relation to this point. Um, and I suppose it's sort of, you know, looking slightly wider here. So this is about rural Indigenous biodiversity to, um, for, for development incentives. To me, we seriously need this in our urban areas, particularly now that our intensification plan has landed. And I, I see that the following recommendation talks about the priorities that we have. Well, we, I'm not sure whether, uh, and I'd like to see that an, that an urban um, part of this is also considered. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we certainly can, uh, as part of potentially F uh, as well, look at what we could do to incentivise uh, good outcomes in urban areas. Um, so we can come back to you on that. You're not wishing to amend the recommendation? No. Okay. Right. Uh, Councillor Coford. Oh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Pavrov. I was just, um, I think, referring to the ur the potential urban panel that we're forming to oh. uh, protect our rural areas as well. Um, yes, we know quite a few rural areas that are coming under um, quite a lot of uh, stress recently with uh, develop developers. And um, yes, I was just wondering if we, we could perhaps um, have some protection there, um, I know that uh, we, we're looking at it with our um, our urban panel development, but um, yeah, is there any, have, do you have any comments about you know, protecting the rural areas in that sense? Well, I mean, we we could definitely talk at some length about about that topic. Um, uh, when it comes to protecting rural areas, we've got rural zones at the moment for a reason and that is because they are encouraging a rural activities to occur on that land. Um, we, we have obviously also got a need to think for the future in terms of the growth of the district, and we have, for example, a growth strategy that identifies some areas that are currently zoned rural that have some potential um, for consideration in the future as, as being um, urbanised. So, I guess in that higher level philosophical sense that the conversation about rural land, different parcels of rural land, areas of rural land, what the future should be, will certainly be a part of our ongoing advice to you, mm -hmm. including as part of the matters addressed under F. Thank you. Look, I'd, I'd like to just move this along because we're just, we're just okay. noting at this stage. Sure. So can we just... Uh, well, uh, yeah, well, so well, look, yeah, I'll move it. 
You'll move it, Councillor Cooper. Yes, all you. right. Yes, Second, uh, uh, you may Kirby. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Those against? Carried. Right. Recommendation F, which is the last thing between us and a short break. So, yeah. <sighs> I feel the pressure. Yeah. Um, Hang on in there, guys. <laughs> yeah, so, so this, when it comes to simple recommendations, this one's probably the most simple because unless someone can come up with a time machine, we're not going to be able to report back to you by the original deadline of February um, on those matters. Um, but let, let me go back a little step first. Um, so Plan Change 2, you will recall very well, um, uh, part of the resolutions back in August last year was to seek that the staff come back to you, uh, do some investigations and, re and report back on a wide range of matters. They include things like managing hazards, um, they also include urban development and, and consideration of a um, urban panel was certainly within the scope of matters that we were anticipating there um, a mana whenua plan change work on papakainga design guides wide range of things and really um, this recommendation is simply saying we're still working on those things we're keen to sequence this work a little bit better now and, and line it up with consideration of what comes out of the vision consultation yeah. for example um, uh, and, and so we're just really saying Instead of the original deadline that was set back in August 2023, which has already passed, um, we're asking you to make a decision to to say we'll get staff will report back to you on those matters by December this year. Councillor Pavano, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Through the chair, um, in relation to F, given the conversations and questions for the previous um, recommendations that we have approved. I would like to foreshadow that I'd like to make an amendment to F, um, which after it's got range of matters, to include urban vegetation and indigenous biodiversity rules. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Wilson. Um, yeah, just further oh. to Councillor Pavlova. Um, <laughs> the... Um, yeah, I, I, I think she's on the money with that one, actually. But also, um, how realistic, given that we've had LTP with a whole bunch of stuff, how realistic is it without causing um, massive amounts of stress to that December deadline? Because, you know, there's no point in putting people un, under stress in a, um, if it's going to take longer, it's going to take longer. This seems quite directive. I mean, ideally, if that's what you want, then that's great. Um, but it should, these sorts of things, they're quite important. They should take as long as they need to take. Yeah. Thank you um, for, for considering that. Um, I think maybe just to give a little bit of assurance, I, I don't think for a minute that the report back that we are suggesting, recommending, happen by December is the one and only one-stop shop. I think it's it's likely that we're going to need to have a sequence of conversations about those pieces of work that are signalled in that resolution. This this is really looking, and, and there, there are exact words there around um, scoping, and that can leave room for that to evolve further. It's just trying to, I guess, progressively add more and more shape to that forward work program. So, Councillor Co. Oh, sorry, you hold this. Yeah, so I have a question, just to make sure we don't have any fish hooks today. If we were to include the word um, after the <coughs> word matters, including Indigenous biodiversity in rural and urban areas, would that be, would that fit with the proposed work program for the rest of the year? Would there be any problems with that from a capacity perspective? I, well, I think maybe I'll say to you, um, the short answer will be potentially yes, because we haven't shown you everything that you could potentially look at. So you will be prioritising this in front of potentially other things um, by saying you want to push it in here. Uh, we, we did just want to check back to the recommendation, though. 
You were cool in PC2. You had a list of recommendations that you'd put forward yeah. and agreed, and there was specific things related to PC2 that we were coming back to you on. Um, and I think what Jason's trying to say to you is we're going to have other report backs. That this is only to do with well, the only reason we've brought this back is because we wanted to make sure that we'd formally noted that we can't report back when we said we would. We're coming back to you. There's other things we're also going to come back to you on. So this is not the only district yeah. plan uh, item that we're coming back with. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah. I, I could add to that a little bit, that I, and Chris, you'll correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe what we're looking to do with the policy work program is to actually start to incorporate the forward work program for the district plan in that. So, as Chris says, there will be a comprehensive account of what the forward work program will be as part of the policy work program. Mm -hmm. This recommendation was intended to just reflect on a resolution that Council's already passed, which does have a particular shape to it, because you've already passed it, and, and changing the deadline for reporting back on that. But as Chris says, um, there are other bits of work. We didn't try to capture in that resolution every possible thing that might be in the district plan forward work program. Yeah. So it seems a bit premature to so make changes to the motion. Yeah, the so I'd, I'd like to move the motion as it is. Yes, yeah, please. Good plan. So I'm moving it. Seconder. Oh, we've got more questions actually. I did have one. Can I ask questions anytime? So I'll just foreshadow then that I'll move. Okay, yeah. all right. Do we have I thought it was Councilor important Clayford, to, yeah. thanks Madam Chair, just thought it was important to just point out that um, a plan change to incorporated um, the intensification that the previous government sort of forced on our uh, mm. town centres and that, and as you know they're pretty overcooked and um, we can see some examples of these, but my point is um, can we have some reference to um, appreciating and um, implementing uh, uh, natural uh, uh, green space areas um, to just to relieve the um, you know the, the very dense um, uh, developments um, and for instance the market gardens and old tacky are being developed one after the other and it looks like a sprawl if we have a green belt in between each one uh, you know we, we would have a much better environment. But I just put, thought I'd put, point that out if we could um, have reference to um, natural open green spaces and open spaces, if we protect those as a relief to the intensification and plan change too. I thought, yeah, I did. I thought I might take this one. I think the point you're raising is really important, um, and I think we've talked about this for some time. Um, uh, what we've previously said, and I'll reiterate and reinforce, is that is very much on um, the agenda. Uh, I, um, I keep referring to the master planning, the stuff that's coming through, uh, but effectively, we aren't planning to talk about that today, but it is coming through. Okay. Um, and I can say to you that, um, and I will say, we, we're still shaping the idea of the urban plan, uh, a panel, sorry, but all the things that we've talked about fall under that master plan. So we're just not talking about them all today, but absolutely, it's on our radar. We're, we're going to be coming back and, and, and giving you the opportunity to really sort of lift the hood on the things that are important to you and help us prioritise what's coming through. Councillor Pavanam, do you have another question? No, I was just going to wait until we get to debate. Sorry, I thought uh, the motion had been... Uh, OK, all right. Yeah. So we'll take the motion. Uh, have, do you have a seconder for the motion, please? Uh, Deputy Mayor Kirby. Uh, any debate? Oh, do you want to introduce your motion? Jocelyn, could you switch off for a tick, please? Thank you. Yeah, so I've heard from um, from staff that this is quite a specific recommendation and relates to a previous decision of council, so I think it's important that we progress this motion as is today. Um, not to say that the issue of biodiversity in rural and urban areas isn't extremely important, but we've heard that that's firmly in the work program and part of what we're doing um, as a matter of course. So I would encourage um, Councillor Pravanov, who's foreshadowed that she would like to amend this motion to move this motion through as is. And um, if we want to formalise something around biodiversity, do that and um, um, 
consider that separately or ideally just uh, rightly regard it as out of the scope of the recommendations that are in front of us today. We don't have background information on that. We don't have, um, uh, we don't have a report on that. So moving a recommendation around that today would be prioritising on the fly and in an absence of information. So um, yeah, happy to move this recommendation as is today. And also while I've got the floor, just thanks so much to Jason and Matt and the team for the enormous amount of work. As Jason said at the start, this is a ceremonial day as we <laughs> seize into the <laughs> district plan. But the, it's, it's like an iceberg. What we're seeing on the surface today yeah. is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the work that's yeah. happened behind the scenes and is sitting there yeah. under the water. Thank you. Um, Councillor Provanov. Uh, yes, I thank you through the chair. Um, I, as we've heard today, that um, until there is some protection of urban trees, trees are going to be cut down, such as occurred in 14 Narara Road, and I suggest that people maybe look at what, what is on Google, Google Maps and then go and see what is actually there on that site. It's been totally denuded. And so until we have some rules and regulations in place, that will continue. I... Um, in terms of making an amendment, which I would like to do, it's not actually prioritising anything above anything else. It's just ensuring that it's actually on the list. So do you wish to make to move an amendment? Yes, to so motion? there, um, so and, and based on what's F, so I've, what I've got here is um, it's got a range of matters, including urban vegetation and indigenous biodiversity rules. So I know that our Mayor made the comment about, I think when she talked earlier on about our rural biodiversity, I'm talking specifically here about urban. Uh, so procedurally we need... Oh, right. Right, we just have some advice here that um, that this was a council decision and we don't have necessarily the right to amend that at this level, at the strategy ops and finance level. Okay, okay, if that is the case. Um, so we're actually not aware of what is going to be, what those range of matters are. Could we pr mm. be provided with that list, please? Yes, I see. Yeah. Last uh, year. Justin, look, I think, you know, you've raised a really important issue. I think staff, you know, are saying they agree this is a really important okay. issue and it's a matter of how we deal with it. Okay. And what we're saying is let's just carry on with this as it is now and staff will come back to us. Uh, uh, paragraph 42. Yeah, paragraph 42 is, sets out the, the detail. Okay. So uh, let's just <clears throat> roll with it for now. Okay, and, that's fine. And staff will, because it, yeah, it is something that we do need to progress, and there is some urgency around it because probably you know maybe as we speak, trees are being chopped down somewhere. So yes. Okay, I withdraw that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So no more questions. Sorry. Um, yeah, just further to Councillor Dostoevsky's motion that she was going to put and is now withdrawn but um where this is do, is does is the plan differentiate between suburban and urban yeah uh, yeah yeah you can uh, yeah you can answer it yeah the, the planned zones land as being general residential zone or other kinds like industrial or rural, e every piece of land other than river corridor, flood hazard land um, or open space has some kind <coughs> of a zone. So yes, it does differentiate. Okay. Um, I just thought it. I just thought it important that if, when we're yeah, discussing yeah. Yeah, yeah, these yeah. things that we that the terminology that, that yeah. we're using is uh, is accurate. But also, just given, and perhaps this is an offline conversation, but given what we do know is happening on properties, where uh, under plan change two, we were given all sorts of assurances. So, um, and I'm happy to have this have this chat offline. But 
I, those assurances are starting to sound a little hollow. Um, so I want to just, and others here too, will want to just know um, what's happening and what the response might be. Okay, just, there's a comment from Chris here. Yeah, uh, and I'm happy to take that. And um, maybe I'll respond to that point first, um, Councillor Wilson. Just to note that um, we're very much taking um, the feedback that you give us seriously. Um, uh, I will say that we have um, we have a limited resource pool that works on, this, on uh, in the district planning area, and just talking about all the things that you've just seen come through, which were on hold because of PC2, we've now come back up and surfaced to to get them on the table to you. This is the next thing that's coming through alongside our wider sweep of going, guys. We've heard a lot from you. Where do you want to prioritise it? What's the next thing that's going to come? What's the cap off the rank? Also to note, unfortunately, outside of our control, these are the slowest processes in New Zealand. Um, you see four points up there, but you all know that that's years worth of work, consultation, notification, a whole bunch of stuff happens. So it's not that we aren't doing things, it's just unfortunately it takes time. Um, I do want to note, though, in terms of um, the question around can we build in some flavour to the recommendations, um, in uh, paragraph 42 of your paper, 42.1, um, just talks to the 10th of August decision that you've asked to make, and it says here that the potential scope for further changes to the district plan related to future urban development and some other things what we will say to you is we've heard you today, we will include the areas that you're interested in in that um, part of the recommendation. So Jason's and Matt are noting that down, so we'll make sure when we come back that we include it. So there's no need to make an amendment, we'll make sure we've covered that off for you. All right, thank you. So I'd like to move uh, if... Oh no, you've, you've already moved it, sorry. Yep, beg your pardon, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All right, those against? Carried. Right, I, I suggest we have a, a five minute break now and just a reminder, we do have a matter of an urgent nature to discuss as well as confirmation of the minutes. So we'll see you back here in five minutes, thank you.